Norfolk Island is Australia's most easterly, more than 1,500 kilometres from the mainland. It's closer to New Caledonia and New Zealand than to Australia, yet it was settled by the Europeans less than six weeks after Sydney. It has a remarkable history, from convicts to the bounty mutineers to a tax haven. Yet some harsh modern-day economic realities are forcing it to say goodbye to a unique way of life. Norfolk Island is a place where waving hello to passers-by is mandatory. Here, nobody bothers to lock up their houses or their cars. Cows roam along the winding roads, and history is around every turn. Tourism is the island's lifeblood. Every night, descendants of the real characters take part in a quirky, lip-synced recreation of the infamous mutiny on the bounty against Captain Bly. There will be none of that. I warn you, this ship will run without threats and taunts. I love living amongst pirates. <laughs> it's fantastic. I love a little mutiny. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that aspect of their, their personalities and, and their history, I find fabulous. I, I love it, really enjoy um, what, it, what comes out of that, what comes out of that character. They're so resilient and they're so resourceful. And I just love that about those people. These rugged cliffs and green rolling hills have been home to soldiers, convicts and mutineers. And for 30 years, internationally renowned author Colleen McCulloch. Norfolk Island's unique. There is no other place like it. When I don't like going away. When I come back, it's like... Uh, the the reinfusion of lifeblood, you know, this place is where the saucer would land. <laughs> it's different. Fletcher Christian and his mutinous crew first fled to remote Pitcairn. When George III was on the throne, Fletcher Christian and a handful of mutineers chose this craggy speck in the Pacific to hide from the world. Pitcairn is a totally closed community. They're all related and descended from seven assorted Englishmen and the Polynesians who originally settled here. But almost 70 years later, they'd outgrown the tiny island. Britain offered them Norfolk, and the whole community relocated in 1856. But some missed Pitcairn and eventually returned. It's still inhabited today, but the population is less than 50. That remarkable heritage means that Norfolk Island has its own special customs and even its own language. I think you'll, you'll get in a bite. Yeah, I think I got one tweed, tweed process down here. Yeah. yeah. Well, see if you can't catch one our book, because, because them is good wettles. A lot of us are descendant from the Bounty Mutineers and the Tahitian women that, uh, that they took with them. That meant that there's a, a Polynesian element in our culture. Uh, with our food, with the way we fish, with, with the way we speak, we have our own language, uh, which is a mixture of, of English and 18th century English and Tahitian. At a sunset barbecue, local girls are performing the famous Tahitian dance, the tamaray. 
Another island tradition passed down through the generations and across the seas. The Tahitians came to here, so when they came over to here, they also brought their culture and their dancing. It's kind of just part of who we are. The hats, the costumes, most of them are all handmade. It's just all part of who we are and where we come from. Mutiny on my ship, by God! I'll have every one of you swing for this! Hold your tongue, you, or I'll cut it out. You dare! The story of the Pitcairners is known around the globe largely because it's been told so many times for the big screen. Shoot him! It's the dramatic, romantic and bloodthirsty story of the crew which overthrew Captain Bly and cast him adrift. They burnt the bounty and cut themselves off from the outside world. But the realities of the 21st century are closing in on Norfolk Island. It is in big trouble. But how would you describe things on Norfolk Island at the moment? Powerless, desperation, uh, uh, uncertainty, lack of confidence. I think are probably the four things that come immediately uh, to mind. The business arising out of the minute. Fine. Okay, well, we'll move along. In what is surely the world's smallest parliament, a nine-member legislative assembly is headed by Chief Minister David Buffett. It runs most of the island's affairs, and the 2,000 or so locals pay no Australian income tax. Now this fiercely independent community can no longer support itself and needs help from the mainland. I worry. We all worry. That's part of the difficulty of this community at this moment. It's, it's tremendous stress for each member of the Norfolk Island community. How hard is it to balance the culture and the history here and the self-sufficiency, I guess, with asking for help from the mainland? The hesitancy in doing that relates to the, to the culture of this place, of doing things on our own account. And there was a continuity of wanting to do that. There is still a want to continue to do that but there is a recognition of the financial wind that has been taken out of our sails at this moment. A combination of the global financial crisis and overwhelming infrastructure costs has hit hard. Tourism has slumped by more than 30%. Employment is down and 25% of homes on the island are for sale. People who have had to split up their families by sending, by going offshore to work and sending money back. I know there are people who have simply closed up their homes here on the island and abandoned them because they can't sell them. There's no resale market. They've gone off to settle elsewhere and to work elsewhere. Donald Christian Reynolds is a direct descendant of Fletcher Christian, proud of his heritage and his home. Welcome aboard a Moa tour. I should tell you from the outset that I am a seventh generation descendant of Fletcher Christian and his Tahitian wife Moa tour. So if any of you are Blyes or Bly descendants, you really should tell me now. The drop in tourism has all but destroyed his livelihood. And this one here with the white tufts on them, that has a pipe-like formation. That's referred to as pipe organ coral, that one. But Donald believes the limited services and isolation of Norfolk have played a part in a much greater tragedy. Most fish have pectoral fins, but they don't always use them to propel themselves. This is Michelle here. And she loved life, you know. She was a very effervescent girl and she had a lot of fun about her. His daughter Michelle struggled for years with schizophrenia. There is no welfare safety net here, not even Medicare. The island is responsible for its own health system. The sad part is, I guess, if, if um, Michelle had just died and was buried and, and, uh, and nothing comes out of her legacy of why she died, um, it would be a complete waste. So, you know, we're trying to 
to make sure that that doesn't happen to anybody else. But what the island lacks in facilities, it more than makes up for in community spirit. As locals struggle to pay the bills, a church group has set up a food bank and demand just keeps growing. We have increased from about 30 individuals a month to now that we're feeding about 90 individuals a month. Now that includes children, that's not just adults. So that's whole families, single individuals, one parent families and the like. It's that sense of community that lured adventurous Sorrel will be to Norfolk. Just a big country town surrounded by sea. It's beautiful. It's like a little, I don't know, a little strange oddball community that's been uprooted from the mainland and boom, <laughs> just shoved in the sea. It's beautiful, I love it. For her work, Sorrel has travelled to most places on the planet, but she and her family have chosen to settle here, starting out in an empty shed. Within that three days, that shed had a bed, it had bookcases, it had blankets, it had people rolled pumpkins down the driveway, <laughs> they bought fish. They heard that this little family from Australia had arrived <laughs> in hideous weather and the ship hadn't come and they just embraced us wholly and looked after us. And I cherish that memory. And that really is, in this day and age, to have that, that sort of welcome. How could you ever forget that? It's just a standout, an absolute standout. Brad Forrester runs the only factory on the island making soft drinks and liqueurs. He wasn't born here, but has also experienced the Norfolk way. Most people are, are incredibly hospitable and would, you know, give the shirt off your back if you needed to or if you're in times of need. And I actually recall quite vividly when my mum passed away. The community just completely surrounded my father and, you know, as an example, he didn't even have to cook or fend for himself for well over a year. The local people just took it on board and, and, and brought, uh, uh, brought whatever support they, they felt was appropriate. Now behind this wall on the right is our courthouse, legislative assembly chambers and other buildings are used by our government. Norfolk Island government occupy most of those buildings there on the right. We are an Australian territory with, uh, with a self-government. It's, uh, it's interesting, it's very... And now we sing God Save the Queen. From these sandstone colonial buildings, the island's extensive bureaucracy with its extensive filing system, deals with everything from local issues to education and immigration. These staff run a hospital, a school, an airport, and even a telecommunications network, all for an island of less than 2,000 people. Being able to sustain all those services with a government in infrastructure, which is horrendous in comparison to the size of the community, um, it all had to burst at some stage, and I think that's what's happened. Come on, girl. Robin Mengetti now breeds cattle on Norfolk for her restaurant, but before marrying a local farmer, she came to the island to become its CEO. We deal with rubbish roads, immigration, customs, schools, liquor bonds, lightridge. Everything's got to be dealt with by the one government and they just really don't have the resources to do it. The locals here cherish their tiny island and its unique way of life. And for many, there was enormous suspicion about the idea of any kind of federal government involvement or influence. But as the economic realities start to hit harder and harder, more people are changing their minds. They say there does need to be a new system here and for many, the sooner the better. Basically what's happened over the last 10 years is they've just continued on that downward spiral without putting any strategy, strategies in place to try and address the problems. Uh, and I think it's just come to the crunch where we're basically at our knees and we've had to go to the Commonwealth and say, uh, we need to be bailed out.
As the 36th administrator, Neil Pope is the latest in a long line of Australian influence on Norfolk, stretching back to Governor King in 1790. From old government house overlooking the settlement of Kingston, it will be up to him to sign off on the island's future. As administrator of Norfolk Island, uh, I um, am the titular head of the Norfolk Island government, but I'm also the, the, uh, the spokesperson for the Commonwealth. Um, I see my role as getting both governments to ensure that the reform agenda is followed through and that the Norfolk Island uh, residents are the beneficiaries. Both governments working together to ensure that we get the governance issues right. We actually get the private sector involved in Norfolk Island instead of all of the uh, instrumentalities being run by the Norfolk Island government. As I say, none of those reports have given us any real meaty thing to go on. But there's still a core group which resists any Commonwealth involvement in the running of the island. Rick Robinson is one of them. He's president of the Society of Pitcairn Descendants and also happens to be married to Colleen McCulloch. It's such a the best outcome was for Australia just to go and leave us alone <laughs> and say, if you need a hand, we're here to give you help. It's a kind of 30 pieces of silver situation, really, because uh, uh, the amount of money concerned the Australians and spend on fireworks. <laughs> it, it's just a part and parcel of the ongoing campaign to get rid of any Norfolk Island identity. To understand the depth of feeling here, you need to understand something of the history of this island and what a history it is. Captain James Cook first sighted Norfolk in 1774. Then, just weeks after the first fleet arrived in Sydney, convicts and soldiers settled on Norfolk. In 1825, a second, even more brutal penal colony was established. Effectively, it was a place of banishment. People in Port Arthur who tried to escape or did escape were actually sent here for their punishment. This was worse than Port Arthur. This was the incorrigibles, the re-offenders, multiple murderers. It wouldn't have been a good place to live during the penal days. It was really 30 years of hell on Norfolk Island. The reminders of those times are all around, in the ruins and the gravestones. The island's historic sites were World Heritage listed in 2010. It's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can set the fire. The journey of the Norfolk people is a journey through time, across tens of thousands of kilometres from London to Tahiti, from Pitcairn to Norfolk. If anything sums up this place, it's Bounty Day. On June the 8th every year, locals commemorate the arrival of the Pitcairners on Norfolk. Once again, they recreate the landing of their ancestors on Kingston Pier in 1856. It is their Australia Day and much more. But you won't hear Advance Australia Fair on Norfolk Island. It's God Save the Queen. God save our gracious Queen, long live our noble Queen. God save our Queen. After all, it was Queen Victoria who granted them their new home. Those same original families, descended directly from the mutineers, are still here in force. The Quintals, Evans, McCoys, Buffets, Nobs, Christians and Youngs. Each year they compete for the title of Family of the Year. It's the Adams family.
This book is part of the family. It's, uh, it's the oldest member of the family. It's uh, nearly 200 years old. One of Arthur Evans' ancestors was amongst those first arrivals and started this diary that day. In 1856, the 8th of June, day by day, activities and things that happened on the island here. I heard him catch this deer. Them old mart. We went. As if we're not. Wow. One thing you reckon? We might skunk. Well, on my passport, it says that I'm an Australian. I'm fine about that, but in my heart, I'm a North Islander. And we, we are very proud of our culture, our language, and we'll never lose that. I go and cook a plum pill I love for my snack. Now I cook it and look good. At the local school, the traditional language is now part of the curriculum. Thanks for me, Nana. Dozen bananas, sweet plum, and one cup of flour. As a child, Gordy Duran wasn't allowed to speak her native tongue at school. Now she's part of a concerted effort to keep the language alive. I have four grandchildren that go to the school here, and I'm very proud that that we are teaching them the Norfolk way. We need to keep our tradition going here, you know. For a little while, I think we've forgotten that we were Norfolk Islanders and forgot our tradition. But now, with the changing world, we're realising, hey, we're going to lose our traditions if we don't do something about it or teach our children about it. Norfolk Island is famous for its history and, of course, for the iconic Norfolk Island pine, a tree recognised around the world. But now it's also famous for a modern-day murder. In 2004, I reported from the island on the killing of Sydney woman Janelle Patton. It's the biggest mass collection of fingerprints ever in Australia. The investigation by the Australian Federal Police included a voluntary fingerprinting exercise. In a climate of speculation and innuendo, more than 200 island residents refused to take part. You don't need to be here long to realise that this place thrives on gossip. And as you'd expect, everyone has something to say about what happened to Janelle Patton. People will confide elaborate, sometimes bizarre theories about who killed her and why. As one resident commented, whether they like it or not, the police have got an extra 1,800 amateur detectives working on this case, the population of Norfolk Island. So they know every name of the person who was on the island the day Janelle was murdered. So police have the killer's name? The police know the name of who killed Janelle Patton. They just don't know which name. Glenn McNeil has been found guilty of murdering Janelle Patton on Norfolk Island. The jury took less than 24 hours to convict him. McNeil had been working as a chef on the island when he stabbed Miss Patton to death five years ago. Norfolk Island has no natural harbour. All its cargo has to be unloaded out at sea and into open boats. It's no wonder that everything costs so much. A litre of milk is more than $7, yoghurt 14 and fuel is $2.50 a litre. We have to do something with respect to the way that uh, uh, the ships come in and, uh, and unloading uh, freight. We have to do something with respect to getting containerisation. We don't have a port, uh, and I appreciate a port is hundreds of millions of dollars. What we need to do is find alternatives. Just as their ancestors did on the rocky shores of Pitcairn, the Norfolk Islanders still surf their open boats ashore. It's quite a sight. Remarkable seamanship and yet another throwback to a bygone era. For many here, the Norfolk Way will always be the only way. All 193 people came here to live from Pitcairn. Since then, we've, we've been recognised by the UN as the Indigenous people of Norfolk Island. It's our homeland. And that, that's the part a lot of Canberra people don't understand. It's our homeland. 
going to lose our culture. And that's all mixed up with our way of life. And that would be more than just sad. It would be a calamity. I do feel optimistic about, about the future. And look, it's a beautiful place. It has a, it has a wonderful future as a tourism destination. I, d I don't doubt that. I think that we can forget about going back to the heady days of 40, 45,000 tourists a year. And I don't, quite frankly, I don't think that that would be appropriate. But we need to, we need to plateau out now to stop the decline. Uh, once we stop the decline, we can take stock and we can start to move forward. When we're moving forward, hand in hand with the Commonwealth. The man who will ultimately have to make all this work is also optimistic. It's a magnificent island. It is the most beautiful island that I think I've ever been to. And so with what it has to offer, as long as we can get the promotion of it up, um, we will get the tourists back there. We're after the baby boomers. We're also after young people. Um, in the past, it's been known as an island for the newlyweds and the nelly deads. We need to change that. <laughs>